Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 95. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Amber. Hi, everyone. And we are going to be talking about the best games of 2020. Our end of the year, not really the end of the year, it's the beginning of the next year, but two years later, best of games list. So exciting. <laughs> I haven't even processed that in my own brain, Mark. It didn't make any sense. I mean, it kind of made sense. But yeah, we're doing the best of 2020, even though it is 2022, for a few reasons. Primarily because at the end of 2020, I didn't feel like I had played enough new releases, 2020 releases, to have a justified best of list. I'd played hardly any, uh, mostly because of the pandemic, of course. And so, inspired by Paul Grogan, who does his best uh, of lists a year later, that gave me the impetus to just say, I'm going to start doing that as well. So thank you, Paul. Uh, You are literally an inspiration in this case. So now I've played enough games, not as many as I wanted to, that were 2020 releases, but that's the reality of board gaming. I mean, like if you're a movie critic, you can pretty much watch all the movies you want to watch with maybe a couple exceptions in a given year like you could watch like the average movie critic i think watches somewhere you know 250 to 500 movies in a year yeah they're only two hours and you can do it by yourself yeah with a board game most of them you can't do by yourself or at least not a complete picture by yourself and they can take a long time it requires other people Obviously, the places like the Dice Tower that have multiple people on staff who are working full-time can play many, many more games uh, than someone like me who's by myself and has to rely on wonderful friends and spouses as Mm -hmm. play people, play partners, Mm -hmm. opponents. Mm. Worthy opponents. Yeah. (laughs) So, it's a struggle. And a lot of... Because of the pandemic and the and the shipping problems, the global shipping problems, uh, a lot of companies don't have had a lot of trouble keeping games in stock, and so they're much less likely to send a lot of games out to reviewers. And the rise of places like Tabletopia or sites like Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator or the other couple of simulation programs uh, has shifted a lot of like review copy stuff and preview stuff to digital but the problem is i really hate it (laughs) i hate playing games like that so much not that i dislike it necessarily so much but i never feel like i get an accurate depiction of the or an accurate picture of the game no i feel like i'm missing something there even when i'm playing with people you know that who i know and so I, I've been trying to do that as little as possible, but I completely understand why publishers are opting towards that. So it leaves me in a bit of a pickle. Yeah, it makes sense for logistical reasons, but I always say when you play the board games, you are definitely playing the players along with the game. And I would never play a board game on a computer. It just doesn't make sense to me. You've played on Board Game Arena though, right? No. You haven't joined in on that at all. No, I've never played on Board Game Arena. I did enjoy playing Dominion with you on that old website. Yeah. But cards are a little bit different. I'm used to playing hearts on the computer or spades or things like backgammon or chess or checkers. But I don't know. It, It detracts from the experience. I think it's a good tool for convenience, but it's so hard to get into the game if it's on the computer. I agree. And... You know, I might have to adjust in the future or just change some stuff because uh, it seems like, you know, that's just the way reviews are going to be done by a lot of people, except for the big, big names. Well, I think it would make sense for a first look review to decide if you want to review it actually in depth, right? Perhaps. Yeah, I suppose. I guess that's a fair point. The problem is, again, it's even harder to get find people, at least in my case, to find people to play with on those platforms so anyways that's too much whining for the podcast that's (laughs) why it's delayed a year uh but i'm fine with that because i review old games and i look at old older games all the time and i think that's very valuable thing to do so as i think i said earlier i played about 25 games from 2020 
Um, and as always, I'm defining a 2020 release by Board Game Geek. If it says it's a 2020 release there, I'm not second guessing that. There's probably more precise ways, but they probably take way more time. So I'm just relying on that. There's still many I wish I had a chance to play. I made a list. I got through a few more from of that from that list in the last couple of months, but the main ones um, that I wish I had gotten a chance to play before this podcast, uh, where I arbitrarily set a date of end of January, are Anno eighteen hundred, uh, the Martin Wallace economic game, Curious Cargo, the two player sequel to Pipeline. Um, Pan Am, which I actually just received a copy of yesterday, uh, but have not played yet. Santa Monica, Calico, High Rise, Hollertau, the new Uwe Rosenberg game. Uh, Forgotten Waters, The Cost, and then there are a couple of war games, which are are particularly hard for me to get to the table uh, that I had on my list. So those are the main ones that I wish I had a chance to play, uh, but... In the system I have set up, as you will discover soon, I look at board games from the past when I do these lists. uh, Because, again, I think it's very important not just to focus on what's new and shiny. So, uh, 2020 games in uh, a few years will get a revisit. And I'll probably have played a few more of those games. Because I'm still going to try to get them played. I looked at the top games on Board Game Geek rankings, uh, which, of course, are more a sign of popularity than necessarily what people think of them. I mean, it's a combination of both, but the game needs to be very popular to to rise the ranks on Board Game Geek. And the main games, with a couple of exceptions on Board Game Geek from 2020 that are high in the rankings, are reprints and second editions. So you've got Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, which is the small box version of Gloomhaven, which I've heard great things about, and I assume... If I had played, given it's the same base system as Gloomhaven, would be... I don't know if I'd put it on the list because it's kind of the same game. uh, But would probably be atop the list if I did. Assuming, you know, from what I understand, it's it's Gloomhaven still. Uh, You got Eclipse 2nd Edition, uh, which I did play a little bit on tabletop. I played like a third of a game. It's basically Eclipse with better... Is it better graphic design? I forget. They improve some, like, quality of life stuff. Uh, the new version of Kanban, uh, which is actually my least favorite Lacerda game that I've played. Uh, second least favorite. Behind, um, what was that Bank Robber one? I don't think you played it. Mm-mm. Escape Plan. I did not like Escape Plan very much. In terms of original games that aren't second editions or reprints, uh, the big hits from 2020, according to the masses, are Dune Imperium and Lost Runes of Arnak, both of which I've played. Uh, and neither of which are making the top five. Uh, I found both of them to be pretty good, but not great. I found them, yeah, to be exceedingly competent games, but not particularly exciting, which is interesting. I don't know what about those games has caught the gaming zeitgeist so heavily, um, especially Dune Imperium. Actually, both of them. I don't. I don't quite understand it. I don't know. They're very middle-of-the-road games. I don't think I played either of them. Is that the Dune we we played at Bubba's house? Yes. Oh, I actually liked that one. I liked Dune Imperium. Well, I like both of them, but I just think they're, like, they're solid. Like, they weren't super special. Yeah, I like, I like our list of top five. I don't think I would replace it with Dune. So, there we go. I'm usually actually pretty in line with what people find like what the popular games are like if you look at my ratings of the games that are on the bgg top 100 they're pretty in line with what the population likes what the hobbyists like the people who go to bgg uh those two seem a little out of sync maybe maybe i'm getting cranky in my old age mark you've always been cranky yeah i mean there is this thing where like with any kind of critic, right, you play so many games or you watch so many movies and eventually you start craving novelty more than you did before relative to other aspects of excellence. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe that's what's happening to me. Well, actually, I I know that's what's happening to me. If Arnak was the first, like one of the earliest, like straight down the middle Euro games I'd played, I'd probably really, really like it if I, you know, if it was released seven years ago when I played it then. 
because uh, I'd have that nostalgia factor. So I don't know how to how to compensate for that as a reviewer, and I'm uh, not even gonna try really. I don't think you need to compensate for it. Plenty of people are reviewing the popular games, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, you're fine. You can you can concentrate on and the concentrate stuff you like. on my weird stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, I look back at my previous game of the year awards, and I have consistently, well, I've only done it a handful of times. Uh, rather than 2017, I've gone with the weird choices. 2017, I gave a tie to tied first place to Spirit Island and Gloomhaven, which you know are popular choices, obviously. And then in 2018, I gave it to the 18xx game 1822CA, which I gotta play again. I played it. I played it once or twice since then. Uh, it is epic and spectacular. And then in 2019, I gave it to Pax Transhumanity, which I can't get anyone to play with me. <laughs> you played that, right? And hated it? Did I? The, the, Maybe not. The name of the game sounds like something I would not play. I don't know. It's a bizarre game. Mm. Anyways, uh, so we got one, so far one normal year, two weird selection years, and this one's also going to be a weird selection. It is a little weird. A little bit. I mean, not as weird as Pax Transhumanity, but... A few games are. So before we get to the top five, uh, I've got some honorable mentions. Um, First one is Clinic Deluxe Edition, which I did not include because it was essentially a reprint. But it's a very heavy Euro game. I got one play of it. I I found it very interesting, fascinating. had some fun concepts in there. I do want to play it again to get a better grasp of it and maybe write up a review. But that would be in consideration for the top five if uh, I, I counted it. Other honorable mention is an incredible expansion, the new Spirit Island expansion, Jagged Earth, which is just a treasure trove of goodies for people who are really into Spirit Island. I would not recommend it at all if you're a newbie to Spirit Island. Once you get comfortable with the base game, then look into these expansions. Uh, the first one you can pretty you can transition. The first expansion you can transition into pretty easily. This one is. A lot. Yeah. It's I, just stuff. I have not even uh, tried to play with any of the new spirits or anything. I mean, there's some that are like medium difficulty, but most yeah. of them are complex for sure. Yeah. It adds new concepts, uh, but it's a truly incredible expansion. It's just a, a chest full of gold. And then the most unique game I played of the 2020 releases I've played, uh, which I think is getting a brand new, like, English printed edition. I I think I saw this on Board Game Geek. uh, Is called Cat in the Box. And this is a Japanese, I think Japanese, trick-taking game. That's a quantum trick-taking game. So it's named after Schrodinger's Cat. And it's a trick-taking game in which the cards don't have suits printed on them. And you say what suit it is when you play the card. And then you keep track of which cards have been played. And you try to avoid paradoxes or situations in which you cannot play a legal card. Because there's only one copy of each card. It's pretty crazy. And again, I want to play it more uh, for sure. But that's definitely the most unique game. Most obscure game that I played, I think of the 2020 games, and I wanted to give it a shout-out for sure. So, let's go now to the top five games of 2020. These are my selections, although I think Amber broadly like you like this list, yeah? Yeah, I would put them in a different order, but I do like all of these games very, very well. Nice. Yeah. Number five, game we've been binging. Because it's my favorite, and I think it would should you, be number one. Oh, you would put this one at number one? Yes. Yes. Uh, and that is The Search for Planet X, a deduction game. I just reviewed it. I think it's, as I said in my review, I don't. I think there's a cap on how good deduction games can be because they're so locked in and game, board games to me thrive in the amb- ambiguous spaces. And deduction games by design, you know, the deduction part does not have ambiguity. Mm-hmm. I mean, it has doubt and it has incomplete information, but... 
once you're able to solve the problem, you are able to solve the problem absolutely. Anyway, so I think there's a cap on that, but I think Planet X is probably about as good as a deduction game can get. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I made Mark play it far more than I think he wanted to. Maybe <laughs> one time more than I really wanted to. It was just a lot of fun. But um, it is fun. And it's a lot of fun win or lose. I think Mark and I are very evenly matched. And so the game isn't so much about who's going to locate Planet X first. The game is more about who gets an edge along the way, a slight edge in all of the other little things you can do to get points. Um, I found that we have always successfully found Planet X, both of us. Right. I don't think we've ever missed it. No. Other people have. Which is surprising. Um, but I've definitely done a 50-50 guess once or twice. I've um, done it once. But but it's pretty well easy to deduce within the same turn. And even though both players have different sets of information based on how they choose to play the game, it somehow works out where the information that you get, I don't know, it, it's pretty well in line with the other player. It's different, but you can all get to the result. Yeah. And because like the deduction part, once you are able to deduce it, you you pretty much know when you've reached that point. The game becomes about what questions you ask. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, it's interesting. Uh, I wrote, like I said, I wrote a review, a full review about it very recently. Go to the website and check that out. Uh, that's number five. Search for Planet X. Really cool game. Number four, and this is the game on this top five list that has the biggest, I think, range of variability in that I think in the future, as I play it more, it could rise very high or fall very far. Hmm. But it's intriguing enough, and I've enjoyed my plays of it enough uh, that it does make the list at this spot, and that is Imperial Struggle, which with the name and designers is set up as kind of a sequel to Twilight Struggle, but isn't really. Like, mechanically, it's extremely different from Twilight Struggle. The, the thing that the two games share is the scale, the global scale of trying to manage different your influence in different parts of the world at once. Uh, Imperial Struggle is definitely more complex. It's got cards, but it's not really a card-driven... Well, it's... it's, it's kind of like halfway to the card driven war game system like the traditional system uh, but it has some other stuff involved it is about the hundred years war um, with England and France so at like the three quarters point in the game like US independence happens that war happens um, and you've got three major regions of the world you're fighting over in Europe you're, you're doing mostly political stuff um, and then in the New World and in India, uh, you're doing more militaristic stuff. But it, you're also trying to balance the political, the economic, and the military. I think it's really fascinating. I haven't really, like, figured out it out. I think I've played it three mm -hmm. or four times, and I'm, I'm still at the point where I feel very much like a novice in the game. Mm -hmm. I will say the most annoying part of it is big chunk is understanding how scoring works and understanding like who's winning in different regions so there's like a lot of counting of that and i wish there was a better system for keeping track of that but besides that it's fascinating and i really want to dive into it more yeah i enjoyed it and i think i will continue to enjoy it but it is really complex <laughs> during our first playthrough there are references to cards and events that happen later in the game that really impact scoring and I had no idea what they were and kind of ignored them and then really got burned when I lost the game because of it. Um, yeah, word of advice, it, you cannot ignore the wars. Like the wars, the four wars that happen during the course of the game mm -hmm. are the primary way to score and influence what's happening like everything is centered around those war events yeah and then keeping track of the board too you you almost don't know what to do so this is a game that i think you have to invest several plays in if you're going to feel competent at all 
this is not something that you can play the first time and, and feel like, oh, I have a handle on it. Or if you do feel like you have a handle on it, you probably spent so much time playing it that it's just not fun. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think that that aspect of like getting lost and trying to figure out what's happening and who's winning is actually sort of thematic with this idea of mm-hmm. these two superpowers trying to essentially control the world as best they can, like the folly in that. Um, I think there's some thematic resonance there, which, which is interesting. Yeah. This one, though, I think different people with different play styles kind of need to come to an understanding of how they're playing. Because <laughs> I approached it where I was just taking everything as it came, not bothering to understand it all because it was just too much outside the scope of my understanding. <laughs> yeah. Your second play, and, it'll it'll open up a whole lot more, for yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I do feel like Mark trounced me in the game. I think we had oh yeah, d- but two eras out of seven or something. What was it? No, we got through three or four. Okay, well, Mark definitely won. <laughs> <laughs> I still have not gotten to final scoring yet, though. Hmm. Orion and I played it a couple times, and I think he won both of those games or all three of those games uh, before final scoring. I think we've only hit the the War of Independence once. In all of my games. So there's a lot I still got to understand with the game. But I do feel like I was on the path to feeling okay about my play last time we played. Well, you were playing against me. (laughs) Yeah, but things started making more sense. Maybe it was because I was teaching. Okay. Because I think the other ones, Orion was the primary teacher and had had read the rule book more. So perhaps that was it. Anyways, number four, Imperial Struggle. Great game. Number three is kind of the comfort pick. This is the game that just feels nice. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about this, I reviewed it also recently, uh, that it doesn't do a lot of new things or any new things. It is some kind of new things, but it just, it's it's a comfort meal. It does a lot of things really, really well. Uh, Anyways, that is Nidavellir, uh, which we talked about in the PAX Unplugged podcast. And have since played it a lot more. I've played it both digitally on Board Game Arena and in person. It's just really nice. It's fun. It's got it's got bidding. It's got collection. Um, it reminds me a lot of Seven Wonders, which I like a lot. Um, it's, it's just a nice, tasty snack. Yeah, I agree with that. It's a very pleasant game. I feel like there's just enough tension to create a good game, but not enough where it feels like there's a lot of pressure or stress. Um, There's a lot of different options in the game, a lot you can do, but at the end of it, I don't know. Like, you create this army? What is it? Army? I don't know. It's colors. You're you're matching colors. It's set collection. Yeah, set collection, but... The things you collect are very satisfying. Satisfying. That's a good word for it. You pile up big chunks of sets and you score tons of points. Like the and winner, everyone scores tons of points. Yeah, you score tons of points. <laughs> like three over 300 usually if you're winning the game. So uh, that's Nid of Lear. It's, uh, it's, it's pleasant for sure. Speaking of pleasant, number two, which was kind of the perfect pandemic game wholly inoffensive in every possible way, but engaging, intriguing, got people coming back for more games. And that is Rainer Knizia's My City, his foray into legacy gaming with a really simple kind of jigsaw puzzly legacy game. Tetris, t- uh, Tetris po- polyomino puzzly. pieces, that's mm-hmm. what they're called, um, which... Send you through 24 different games, each one taking about 20 to 30 minutes. And I've reviewed this one also. The cool thing about his take on Legacy is that it fits Knizia so much as a designer, how he approached the Legacy game. Because for many Legacy games, and there haven't been that many, but almost all of them are trying to tell a story. It's about narrative. It's about surprises and story beats. My City is about using legacy as an iterative process to take a simple concept and then just fiddle 
mechanically with it, which I thought was really cool. And it's kind of what Kinetsky has been doing his entire career. Like he takes games and sometimes he'll release the same game essentially with two different names in two different regions of the world. Or he'll take a concept and he'll just fiddle with it and he'll get four games out of this one concept of different approaches to that concept. So in, in my city, it's just all in one box, um, which which is really cool. Yeah, this is one where we just wanted to keep playing the next scenario. And I don't really know why when I think about it. Like it... Why why did we want to keep playing and keep It's a great game. You're trying to f- you're pushing your luck on what pieces are going to come out. You're trying to conceptualize the placement of the pieces and plan ahead and prepare for contingencies and just try to maximize your score on each one. Uh, cuz the mechanism is very simple. There's just a deck of cards and they each have a, each card is a different one of these puzzle pieces and when the card gets flipped over, everyone has to place that piece. And you're just trying to do that as efficiently as possible with changing scoring rules throughout uh, each of the different games. And, of course, there's new mm-hmm. pieces and other stuff that goes on. But it essentially just changes the scoring parameters each time. And every time you feel like you got a grasp of what to do, it would just shift it, it on you. Like, yeah. There's one point in the middle where Ben, for a couple games, had like figured out a strategy, and then they could, <laughs> the game just completely undercut his strategy, mm-hmm. which I found great because he was crushing us for those couple of games. Mm-hmm. Ben won, right? I don't even remember. I think it. I was, it was in second. It was you or Ben. It, it wasn't. Was close. I came in dead last, like far last. I was very good at this game. I collapsed in the whole second half. It was mm-hmm. it was a little frustrating, but I couldn't be too frustrated at it. Mark is not very good at be... puzzles. That's why. What? What are you? I'm, I'm excellent at puzzles. No. We just talked about Planet X. No. I keep winning Planet no, X. That kind of puzzle. I mean, jigsaw puzzles. You're not good spatial at spatial puzzles. Mm-hmm. I think I'm okay at spatial puzzles. I can pull a piece out of the box and put it on the puzzle exactly where it belongs. How do you know I can't do that? Because you've tried. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? I don't do jigsaw puzzles. Well, yeah, That's was, my whole thing. Okay, fine, fine. I do a if lot I of them. If I did do them, I do a maybe lot of I them. would be good. Yes, I do a lot of them, and I, so I was good at my city. I also love Tetris, and I'm good at Tetris. I'm pretty good at Tetris. I think I'm okay. <laughs> Anyways, mm-hmm. My City, I keep recommending it to people. It's a wonderful game. A crowd pleaser. I think everyone would like it. Yeah. and I, well, It's it, simple. It works really good with one group to play everything. I could see you having a floater role where anyone can kind of jump in. I, I think it's inclusive for a, a legacy game. I think. It's, oh, it, yeah. It's the kind of thing where you don't have to take it the whole way with the group. It's better. I think you want to. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't have to. I just, I thought it was easier to get into my city than it is for some of the others. Oh, yeah. I I mean, I haven't played all the legacy games, but I think mm -hmm. it's easily, of the ones I know of, it's easily the easiest one to get into Mm -hmm. and to just chill with, Mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, Canizia did it again. He's the best. (laughs) But he doesn't get the number one game. The number one game, again, goes to a weird pick. Although, you know, it is a weird game. I was it, about to say it's pick. not that weird of a game. It is. It is a game that feels very Knizian. Mm-hmm. It feels like Reiner Knizia could have designed it. Uh, but it is the Field of the Cloth of Gold from Amabel Holland and Hollenspiel. And it is cruel and hilarious Mm -hmm. and like just condensed goodness you have two choices on every turn they're both horrible and you do more to influence your opponent's actions than you do to help yourself yes 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 but but just imagine the setting (laughs) amber is really into the theme of this one oh the setting is great Two ridiculously wealthy kings decide to have a grand display of their wealth to each other, of course. Who else are you going to impress but another wealthy king? So they get together on this grand field 
and throw a big party in which they make giant displays of wealth to each other to try to impress each other. Giving away gifts to each other, making displays, I don't know, just generally spending and wasting money. What are some of the examples? They ate dolphin. Oh, yeah, they ate dolphin. It is, it's based mm-hmm. on a real historical thing, which yes, I had yes. not heard of. Apparently, Although I think I probably should have heard of it. It seems like it was a pretty significant thing. What was it? They spent over a third of England's wealth on this party. Something like that. Something absurd. Absurd. And the game is absurd. But in the game, you have choices. And each choice makes you offer a gift to your opponent and then display your own wealth in some form. Mm -hmm. And the gift you give to your opponent is, of course, generous. (laughs) (laughs) But, of course, not too generous. (laughs) And so it becomes a passive-aggressive give and take during the game in which you... uh, it's an insult to your opponent. You, you want to insult them as much as possible, but with great generosity. Yes. yes. It is the ultimate passive-aggressive game. It's thrilling. It's surprising. And, yeah, what a game. It's so good. It's so it's so tiny. If it's in this really tiny, skinny box. Yeah, I'll, well, if you've, if you've ever ordered a game from Hollenspiel, you know they, I think they all come in that box size. Uh, because Hollenspiel uses print on demand, and so mm-hmm. they have very standardized ways of doing things to fit within the parameters of print on demand and, and the company they use to do that. Um, so they all come in the box. Uh, it does have, instead of paper, it has a really kind of cloth, not quite it's cloth. It's like a play mat, whatever the... It's like semi-cloth. Like the top is a fabric, but underneath it's a... I don't know if it's plasticky or... It's not springy. It's not like the spongy material. No, but it's it... not neoprene. It's thinner than mm-hmm. that. It's almost canvas-like. Yeah. Which which feels really nice because I thought it would be paper. A lot of their maps are paper, again, because of cost issues with print on demand. It was nice to not have paper, though. Yeah. Definitely. It all makes sense in its weird, quirky way, and it is just condensed fun. All the fun is packed in more densely than many, many, many games. And really, that's the reason it's my number one. It just delivers economically so many interesting decisions, laughter, frustration, aggravation, taunting. Much taunting. Yes. Uh, wonderful game. Please check it out. I double-checked. It is back in stock. It was out of stock um, because I think of the printer demands print on demand can't really be out of stock uh but it was listed as out of stock for a while but it is now back in stock highly highly recommend it my number one game of 2020 would you have put this number two behind planet x two or three i really did like my city a lot yeah 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 the one two decision was really tight but ultimately field of the cloth of gold is just more daring Mm -hmm. it's more daring and weird and memorable in that way i'm going to remember it i think a longer time uh so that's what gave it that little edge but again both of them very knitzian uh which i'm finding i'm liking more and more here's my top games so comment on your top games but as i said before we're also going to look at the past because i don't think we should dwell only on the new games that is a problem oh man I don't want to shame people. Well, don't call out any names. I'm not going to call out any names. I don't even know the names. They're just random things I'm seeing on like Facebook posts and, and Reddit and stuff. But I've the last three or four top games of all time lists I've seen from people, if you're on board game social media, you'll know what I'm talking about. I think it's from a particular website, maybe the Pub Meeple one, and it posts them in this three by three cube. So they'll say, here are my top nine games of all time. I think the last three or four I've seen in the last couple of weeks are almost entirely games from the last two or three years. And it makes me sad. I'm like, why aren't do these people not play older games ever? Do they haven't have they not had the opportunity? Like, yeah, sure, maybe they're I don't know who they are. Maybe they're brand new to the hobby, but we got to hold on to the old classics. So, that's why I'm going to mention older games. So, we're going to look at my top games from 5 years ago, and by years ago I mean before 2020, 
5, 10, and 20 years before 2020. So let's go to the top five games of 2015, which was an excellent year for board gaming, a very, very good year. Honorable mention goes to Through the Ages, the new version, but again, that's a reprint. The original Through the Ages came out years before, but that version did kind of solidify it. It is definitely the best version of the game. For wholly original games, or at least original enough for inclusion on the list, number five is Mysterium, an excellent party game about being extremely frustrated if you're the ghost. It's about dreams. Yes, it's about trying to communicate dreams and then being forced by the game to not say anything when everyone grievously misinterprets your dreams. And then if you're the people guessing, being extremely confident about your interpretations because obviously they're correct. Obviously. Uh, And that tension really drives it. It can be a very funny game. Number four, Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Uh, I was just discussing this with uh, some people on the Discord channel, some some Patreon supporters, and we were talking about the different pandemic legacies. And I think I don't I haven't heard anything about season zero, which was the third one. It was like a prequel, I think. But I think people are definitely saying season one is the best. Season two is definitely not the best, and then maybe season zero is is very good. Not. As, I don't know. Anyways, all that to say, I think season one is really good. I never finished season two. I only played the first couple of months. I do think it'd be fun to revisit it and finish it out. Uh, But season one is good enough for me. I don't need more Pandemic Legacy necessarily, unless I hear that they're super, super good. But season one was a great experience. I will remember it for a very long time. Number three is Amber's favorite game in the whole wide world that she wants to play all the time. With everyone. I enjoy this game very much. It just requires a very long time commitment and... A particular mood. The mechanism for the fighting just does not make sense ever. Some things just don't make sense in my brain ever, no matter how many times I've played them, no matter how many times Mark has explained the rule. We haven't said the name of the game yet. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. (laughs) This is a good game, though. It's Churchill. (laughs) Uh, which is the three-player negotiation game, diplomacy game, that I recall last time we almost played it, we realized that we would probably, like, attack each other in real life if we did, based on our moods at the time. This was, like, a couple years ago. Oh, yeah, I was not up for playing it, no. (laughs) Uh, But it is... It's about the negotiations and diplomacy between the USSR, England, and the United States during World War II. It's got a really fascinating end-of-game scoring thing, which models kind of the the real-life situation. I was actually just reading that they did a new, in the newest printing of Churchill, or the second printing, I think I got it on the P500, so I got the very first printing. Uh, Enough people got mad at the end of game scoring thing, which in some situations, depending on what happens during the game, you could have a situation in the original printing where you roll a die and whoever was winning subtracts that many points from their score and whoever was losing adds that many points to their score. People hated that so much, even though to me it makes perfect thematic sense uh, if you read about why he made that decision. Uh, That in later printings, he added that instead of a die roll, it's just five points. And then I found the designer diary where Mark Herman talked about this, and it's five points because he rolled a d6 and it was a five. Wow. (laughs) Which is one of the greatest design bits I hate it. Mm. I ever have read. He rolled the dice for us and it was bad, and I hate it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it was... The whole point was that he didn't understand why you had to do it in the first place, so he just arbitrarily picked mm. a number. Uh, mm. We will not be playing by those rules. I don't understand why you would. Anyways, Churchill, quirky, fun, love it. Number two, one of the funniest Euro games of all time, Food Chain Magnate. So great. So fun. I'm staring at it right now. Fondly, we should set aside some time to play that one again. Yes. It's been too long. My favorite part of that game is that the managers are all depicted as very, very young boys. Yeah, they're like Mm -hmm. 14-year-old kids. Mm -hmm. Or the the junior managers. Yes, the junior managers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's got a lot of wit in it. Mm -hmm. 
We'll put it that way. And actually just got a new spotter game. The people who made Food Chain Magnate, that game I have over on the table, The Great Zimbabwe, mm, is yeah. uh, the newest printing of a game from before Food Chain Magnate in their catalog uh, that I hopped on board when they announced it a couple years ago, and I finally got it the other day. So I'm excited to play that one. It looks really cool. Number one favorite game of 2015 is Codenames, which I think by this point is certainly in the category of a modern classic. Yes. Everyone knows about it, even my non-gaming friends. Everyone knows about it, and it's great. Mm -hmm. It's not just something that happened to get popular. It's truly a great game, and I think easily belongs alongside Catan, Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride, like those modern classics that both got popularity, they're they're accessible, they're great games, easily fits on that list, and I could have put Food Chain Magnate first. Again, this is a one-two that were extremely close, but I went with the one that really shaped the hobby for a few years. Like, yeah, we had a huge influx of word games for a while, and we're still getting trickles of them uh, directly because of code names, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if any of them ever, I don't think any of them have met Codename Standard. There have been some no. that are definitely worthy of, of play. And, and uh, we played one the other day, Letter Jam, I think is is quite good. Uh, but I don't think any of them are quite as good as Codenames. No. All right, let's jump back another five years, go to 2010. I've got three games here worth mentioning. As we go back in time, we go to years that I haven't played as many games, so the lists get a little shorter, but I do want to highlight the excellent games from those years. Number three, best game of 2010, Innovation, uh, which, uh, if you read my review, I think is... I had a very interesting experience with the game, hated it at first, played it a couple more times, was like, wait a minute, this might be interesting, and then turned completely around on it once I figured something out uh, I don't know what I figured out about the game, but it is wild and crazy and super, super fun, especially at two players. Did you ever play this one? I did, but I don't remember it very well. I think I only played it once. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really cool. And it's really the only Carl Chuddock game that I've played that I've actually enjoyed. Now, maybe the others I would enjoy once I played them more, like Innovation, but this one really fits me. I also own Matanai. I've played Glory to Rome once. Those seem too chaotic. Innovation seems like you can kind of grapple with it. The other ones seem like out of control, wild, crazy, squealing, rabid pigs. Number two best game of 2010, Seven Wonders. I still love it. Again, Nidavlir reminded me of Seven Wonders, and that is a very, very good thing. I still play it occasionally on Board Game Arena, and every once in a while, in real life, it's very good. I enjoy playing with the expansions, but I've enjoyed the base game by itself a lot still also. I've kind of figured a lot of it out. I wrote a couple of strategy guides uh, that you can find at the website that actually are, I think, my most popular articles. Yeah, They get sense. like 50 hits a day. Every day. That's a lot. Yeah. No, Seven Wonders is still a great game to introduce to new people to the hobby. See, I disagree with that. Really? There are I think so, it's great. There are so many symbols. I think if you wanted to introduce drafting, you definitely go with Sushi Go. But Seven Wonders is more fun. I don't know. Yeah, but like there are tons of icons, even just base game Seven Wonders. So I wouldn't introduce this game necessarily to people that I don't think are going to like complex games but for anyone who is not into the hobby but who likes that kind of thing and would be in for complex games Seven Wonders is great yeah I mean I would introduce any game to someone as their introductory game if I thought they'd like it no I don't buy what I'm saying I don't buy into this idea of the gateway game and that is the kind of game you have to start someone with no, but I don't I'm, think Seven Wonders is a universal, like anyone could start with that. No, but it's a really solid one. It's a good one. It's one of the ones that I often think of. I disagree. Hmm. Anyways, both of those are amazing games and pale in comparison to my number one game of 2010, Dominant Species. 
every single time I play it, I love it more. Every single time. Every, I love it. Every single time I play it, I win. <laughs> and I love this game. We got to play it again. It was mentioned the other day at game night. Maybe we play it again soon. It's it's just so, so good. It's so, 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 so good. I'm going to do my best top games of all time, maybe in a month or so. And keep an eye out on where Dominant Species is. I don't know where it's going to end up, but I think it's going to be even higher than it was last year. And last year it was like number eight, number seven. Mm-hmm. I think it'll be even above that because I adore it so much. Finally, 20 years ago, even games 20 years ago, all of you people out there who only think the new games are good, even 20 years ago, there are brilliant games being made. Are I got we still two play of them. Today? Mm-hmm. We, yeah, still play today. Amber asks for one of these all the time. All the time. All the time. Especially when I'm really tired and, and therefore going to lose at it. Uh, before we get to that one, let's go to number two best game of twenty of 2000, rather. Carcassonne. Again, the modern classic. It's peaceful yet really mean if you want to make it really mean. It was super novel at the time of actually building the play space, the board as what the game was rather than a board game just having a board and playing upon it. It's stayed in print this whole time. It's just a really, really solid game. This is one I would teach to anyone as an introduction universally. Definitely above Seven Wonders. This is a really great one. Amber's looking so skeptical of what I just said. And yes, I would introduce it to most people, but honestly, I think Seven Wonders is a better gateway game for most people, even though it's a little more complex. Bananas. Insane. None of that makes any sense. Carcassonne is so nice. It's so simple. It's right there. It looks so good. You just get little bits of points. You have one tile. You just got to choose where to place it. It's fascinating. It's emergent. Seven Wonders has like 20 icons. Maybe I'm just biased because I learned Seven Wonders first. Like I like Seven... I, I, I think Seven Wonders is the better game. Like I like it more, but not I, for new people. I like Carcassonne more. Whoa. But not for new people. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Interesting. I love Carcassonne. It is such a great game. I, I, it's one of those where I'm almost always in the mood to play it. Not always, but almost always. And it's got a million expansions. I played with one of them. It was very good. There's one with a catapult, which is, like, notoriously awful, I think. I think the... Oh, no, maybe the catapult one people actually enjoyed because it's in, it's just stupid. There's one expansion that people despise, and it's like super rare and out of print and therefore very expensive, but people only get it as like a joke. I think it's been a while since I've looked into that. Anyways, you had lots of expansions for Carcassonne, uh, but number one, best game of 2000 Amber's favorite in the whole wide world. Not the whole wide world, <laughs> just a game that I like playing a lot and I like playing it a lot cause it's short and easy and fun. And that is battle line. Oh look, Reiner Knizia pops up again. It's almost like he's the greatest game designer. Close. So who is the greatest? Well, it's, it's <laughs> Vlada, obviously. Okay, okay. Reiner Knizia has the benefit of numbers. He's the most prolific game designer, for sure. And it's not even close. Uh, but Battleline is delightful. It's what I call a column fighter. Do you think that's a good name for that genre of game? A column fighter? Never heard this term before, but That's oh, because I invented it. Oh, okay. It works. I've coined the term. Yeah, so you got like Lost Cities, you've got uh, Battle Line, you've got Airland and Sea, you've got Hanami Koji, uh, all these games. There's a new one, I think Radlands is one, a new, like, brand new game that I've heard is very good. Dan Thoreau calls them Shot and Tots, uh, which is very funny to me. I just call them column fighters because you're, you're battling in columns and you're just placing cards in columns. You're trying to create kind of poker hands. Uh, but three card poker hands in these columns uh, to try to win five or three in a row. 
and it gets surprisingly complex. Yeah, Mark wins most of these, definitely. Yeah, it's it's definitely a lot of depth from a very little bit of game. I think, Mark, I think you are better at that kind of game, and I'm better at the bigger games overall, generally. Because I... I don't feel like I'm good at Battle Line. But you're better than me. Am Maybe I? I'm just bad at it. I don't know. What's the... Wait a minute. No, you win... You've won, I think, 80%. Really? Yeah. I'm looking it up. But I win Dominant Species. That's so. true. <laughs> For sure. Also, we both lose code names. Okay. Yeah, I've won 9 to 3. I guess I am good at Battle Line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I told you. I don't remember this. Yeah, yes I am. Now I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm good. I feel like I'm missing a lot. Anyways, it's a brilliant game. One of Canancia's best. And the best game, in my opinion, of the games, the very few games I've played from the year 2000. Uh, So there are the best games from 20 years, not ago, but ago in this 2020 artificial timeline we've set up for the purposes of this podcast. All of the games I mentioned are definitely worth seeking out, for sure, or else I wouldn't have mentioned them. So hopefully you got an abundance of new games to try out, new and old. Don't only focus on the new. And we'll be back in a year for the 2021 games. Already I have a giant list on my whiteboard of all the 2021 games I want to try out. And I've already tried a good number of them. So next year will be from an even bigger pool of games, hopefully. i got a couple sitting over on the table ready to go. Yes, Mark. Thank you for the hint. <laughs> that wasn't a hint. I was, I was previewing for the audience. No, no, no. I'm that not... was a hint. <laughs> it wasn't intentionally a hint. But now that you think about it, it was. You're ascribing Freudian... In, not in... Freudian slip-ups to me mm. that... I do not believe in. Is it a Freudian slip if your eyes know what you're saying, even if your brain doesn't? No, your that's, eyes. That's just interpretation, Amber. Mm, mm-hmm. Your eyes definitely said this is a hint. <laughs> Maybe my eyes in my brain aren't communicating anymore. Maybe that's it. Anyways, we'll be back probably the next podcast. We'll be again in about a month, and then we're going to do a big old long series probably at least three podcasts, maybe four, maybe five, of my top 100 games of all time, which I revisit every two years. The last one we did was in 2020, early 2020, and the previous one, 2018. Now it's due for a new one, because years march on, time progresses. Thanks for listening, everybody. For reviews of most of these games, if not all of them, I might have reviewed all of them nearly all of them, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com to support the podcast. Go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. And you can find me on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I also have a YouTube channel, which I am going to start posting more videos on. I already posted one very recently about Hadrian's Wall, a first impressions video, so make sure to subscribe on YouTube also. Uh, And please rate and review the podcast to help the algorithms. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.